afternoon, everyone, and welcome to GIS Studios. We are here on Ask SG Live 758, our youth dialogue for this year. And our theme is moving away from tokenism, youth, a critical part of decision making. My name is SB Francis, and I am the CARICOM Youth Ambassador for St. Lucia. I would like to welcome our Secretary General of the CARICOM Secretariat, Ambassador Erwin Laroque. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the Assistant Secretary General, Ambassador Douglas Slater, um, Michelle Small Bartley, the Deputy Program Manager of Youth Development of, at the CARICOM Secretariat, and the Director of Youth in the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth mm -hmm. Development, Sports, and Local Government, Ms. Mary Wilfred. I would like to also say welcome to our live audience, many of our youth of St. Lucia and those regionally watching us via the internet. To begin, I would like us to stand as we pay tribute to our island, St. Lucia, with the national anthem. Acknowledging all the persons that my colleague has introduced this afternoon. My name is McAllister Hunt, and I'm also one of the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors for St. Lucia. This afternoon's dialogue is indeed a momentous occasion. We have with us many youth representatives from the various organizations on island, as well as, of course, the CARICOM members of the CARICOM Secretariat who have graced us with their presence and have come <coughs> to actually engage us in the topics that we have found to be relevant. Born on St. Lucia's Sister Isle, or more popularly known as the Nature Isle, mm -hmm. Dominican Ambassador Erwin Larocque assumed the office of Secretary General of the CARICOM Secretariat on the 15th of August 2011, following his election by the Conference of Heads of Governments of CARICOM on July 21st in that same year. He is the seventh Secretary General of the CARICOM Secretariat. Ambassador Laroque's service at the CARICOM Secretariat began in 2005, September, when he assumed the position of Assistant Secretary General, Trade and Economic Integration. Educated at Queen's College and the New School for Research, for Social Research that is, both in New York and New York University, he majored in Political Philosophy, Pure Economics and Political Economics. His studies are very obviously prepared him to provide strategic leadership for the continuing of the implementation and further development of the CARICOM single market and economy, also known as CSM. 
Prior to his appointment as Assistant Secretary General, he served as Permanent Secretary in various ministries in Dominica for more than 14 years, including the Ministries of Trade, Industry, Enterprise Development, Tourism, and Foreign Affairs, where he headed the diplomatic service. He also served as the Principal Advisor to the Governments of Dominica on all matters pertaining to economic integration and regional and international trade. With a profound history in management, public administration, economic development, trade, foreign affairs, and diplomacy, Ambassador Rock is definitely an embodiment of knowledge and experience. So ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I introduce to you once more, Ambassador Owen Lorock. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Hunt, and thank you, Ambassador Francis. Um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here with you once again. Uh, this evening for this interaction with youth of our community. Um, I want to recognize in particular CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps. It is through their efforts that this event is taking place here today. And we began doing this in, in 2013. And we've done this as a joint initiative, but the Youth Ambassador Corps taking the lead since then on setting the topics, the place, the location, and etc. And it's been a wonderful experience, and I look forward to us dialoguing again this afternoon. Um, you've chosen some very interesting topics. Um, as I always tell, say when I am here, I'm going to answer as much as I can, and if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I'm going to get back to you on them. But I think I want to be very open. I want to recognize our, our studio audience, the youth here with us. I'm glad you could make it, as well as reaching out to the youth throughout our community. And I'm sure it's those who are listening from the Caribbean diaspora, those persons in other areas that, that have, are logging in. And I look forward to a, a good interactive dialogue with the two of you and the rest of the community. Thank you very much, Ambassador Larocque. Um, this is an interactive youth dialogue, so we're expecting interactions with, of course, our youth. Okay, but we will take a short break and we will ba get back to you with our first thematic area. Thank you. Human trafficking happens in plain sight. Know the signs, see it, report it. To report suspected cases of human trafficking, call the TIP hotline at 847. Le moun ki ni tibi estene e ben tou se, moun ki an bon sante o li wain ka wespiwe se vemin lan. Moun ki pani bon te pe waman kon sa ki ni maladi HIV, alcohol, kafime, ti mamay e gwa moun bien sensible pou se maladi sa la. Moun ki ka tou se ni pou pran pokosyon le yo an pami moun an plas publik. Kouve bouchou le o ka estene e tou se. Visite dokter e ben plas sante yo. Fini tou tretman yo ba ou ou sa jwen jewizon e pi maladi tibi. An responsabilite ou, ede dou bout sime maladi tibi ek HIV. Proteje kon ou ek lezo. Alright, welcome back everybody. And before we proceed to our very first thematic area, just like to let the viewers at home know that if you would like to follow the dialogue on TV and your provider is flow, the channel is channel 122. The very first thematic area to be discussed this afternoon is tokenism. And I will have the honor of giving you a very brief background on the topic. Tokenism is defined as making only a symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of persons from an underrepresented group in order to give the appearance of equality. Tokenism involves the symbolic involvement of a person in an organization due only to a specific characteristic be it gender, race, ethnicity, disability, or age. For this afternoon's dialogue, one of the main focuses would be age, particularly the youth bracket. 
is tokenism truly an issue faced by youth in the Caribbean? There are multiple frameworks and other binding agreements which advocate for representation of youth in the decision-making process. For instance, the Declaration of Paramaribo on the Future of Youth in the Caribbean Community, which came into being in 2010, identifies young people as assets to be developed, not problems to be solved. The Declaration affirms the right of adolescents and youth to participate in decision-making matters in which they have an interest in and that can affect them towards improved standards of living at national and regional levels. However, it has been stated and is abundantly clear that some persons are of the view that simply being a young person does not afford you the right to, influ to influence the decisions that actually ultimately affect you. The Declaration states, we the heads of the Caribbean community are fully convinced of the benefits to be derived from institutionally strengthening and raising the profile of departments responsible for youth affairs national youth councils, the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Program, and other youth governance structures. The heads also declared that they would establish, when necessary, policies and programs to engage the creative intellect and energy of all youth in facing several challenges in the region to support national and regional youth governance networks with clearly articulated roles for national youth councils, CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, and other national and regional structures. Since then, we have definitely seen an increase in youth representation at both the national and regional levels. Here in St. Lucia, for example, certain entities, for example, the National Trust and the National Advisory Board or the Country Coordinating Mechanism, which exists within the Ministry of Health, all seek to ensure that there is youth representation at specific forums or consultations. The CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, as well as members of the National Youth Council Executive, are also invited to participate in regional forums we have also seen the advent of the National Student Council and an increase in the number of subsidiary groups. At this point, I would just like to acknowledge the presence of our members of the National Youth Council and National Students Council, as well as our members from the Ministry of Youth Affairs. Your efforts have definitely been greatly appreciated. As stated in the declaration, governments around the region currently host national youth award ceremonies where young people who work diligently towards the development of youth and community are acknowledged and rewarded for their efforts. Despite the fact that there are now mechanisms in place to acknowledge the efforts of youth, we must admit that there are shortcomings as it relates to crucial aspects of youth development. For example, access to resources, financial and otherwise, varies amongst youth-focused organi organizations. Despite this being very specifically highlighted in the implementation matrix of the CARICOM Youth Development Action Plan as a priority action for the period 2012 to 2017, the CARICOM Youth Development Action Plan is a document which speaks to the goals or the objectives that youth organizations and the relevant ministries are to look forward to or work towards. The matrix states, member states have in, should have in place policies that include provisions for financial and technical support to youth governance structures. To appoint a young person to a position without furnishing them with the skills, knowledge, and access to resources required to carry out their mandate is a subtly malicious practice, which widens the divide between youth development practitioners and the very youth that they aim to serve. A youth leader branded with a title but provided with little to no resources is synonymous to a knight with no sword, a warrior with no axe, or a king with no crown, powerless and ineffective, unable to inspire. After this intro, I would just like to ask one question to get the discussion going. In recent times, some local and regional entities have recognized youth as partners in the decision-making process, and youth have been consulted at varying levels, be it in attending meetings, or even holding positions on certain boards and committees. From the surface, this shows that the opinions of youth are being considered in the planning and execution of initiatives. Nevertheless, you still continue to experience feelings of tokenism within these spaces. Ambassador Lorok. How can we ensure that the opinions and suggestions given by youth in these forums are materialized? Well, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I, I take very seriously these, these outreach programs and the interactions that I've had with, with youth over the years. My, my one major regret is that I don't have the adequate amount of resources to put behind the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors Program. Um, I recognize that there are a number of shortcomings um, that we need to, to beef up on, and we're going to be working on those. But as far as is we are capable of doing this, uh, you mentioned that we've been having 
consultations. We've invited youth ambassadors to not just these four, but um, one-on-ones and on occasions we invite you over to the Secretariat, we consult with you. A major consultation took place when we were preparing the CARICOM strategic plan, the community strategic plan. By the way, we're going to do another one um, starting at the end of this year, and we will be consulted extensively on these, on these plans. The question is, how do we translate what you, or what you express into action? The first thing is that not everything that gets expressed can be put into action. You have to select, you have to prioritize, you have to put it within a framework. We and the Secretary are guided by a certain program of work which is influenced by various factors including the youth. And we try our best to see how we could to do that. I know one of the big issues that, that uh, the youth keep speaking about is representation, that the voice can be heard. And how do we action that? And how do we coordinate among the myriad of various youth groups that exist. Um, I know that there are several national youth councils in, the, in, the, in each of the member states, um, sorry, throughout the region, and within, within the member states there are a number of youth groups. And how do you coordinate, not only nationally, but among all of the youth groups in the 15 member states and the five associate member states? And that's an issue that we have taken up. Um, we, we want to see how using the CARICOM Youth Ambassador um, core as the core, to, to be the, first of all, the interlocutor, as had been, as had been um, anticipated, with the, not just the Secretariat but, and the Secretary General, but with the various organs where that, that, that lends itself to. So that, that is the core. And how then do we reach out? And how then does the, 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 the Youth Ambassador Corps coordinate with all of the other groups? We had a meeting with a consultation, and I guess that was going to be used quite a bit, but that's how we, we do our work with um, many of the CYAs in, in, in Guyana in January. I think you were there. Yes, I was. Correct. I'm not sure if you were there. No, unfortunately. Yeah. And we, we set in train to put in place a mechanism that would allow for that kind of coordination I'm speaking about, with a view to putting forward a recommendation to the heads of government um, on how we could institutionalize that interactive process. Um, we had set a target for this meeting in St. Lucia, knowing that we were coming here. Mm -hmm. Um, regrettably, um, we were not able to achieve that for various reasons. Um, one of which is that um, I did not bring, we didn't, I wasn't able to bring Michelle on board until, until May, our, our Deputy Program Manager of Youth, and as a result, things were not moving as fast as we wanted to. But rest assured that we're going to bring this back on stream. Um, looking forward to seeing how we can make that into a reality. Um, and the other thing that we, we want to do is to look at the youth action plan, set targets, and monitor how we're going to be implementing some of the things that we prioritize. We are now putting in, in, in place throughout the region a resource-based management system, not only for the youth program, but for all of our programs. Mm -hmm. That involves not just the secretariat, but also the member states and the institutions, because whatever we have to do in our region is a partnership in the, between the secretariat, the institutions of the community, and the member states. The member states do most of the implementation, if not all. And we have to be able to account for our stewardship in terms of advancing the regional integration movement. So what I can do here this evening is to commit to ensuring that we, we do live up to that commitment we made in January of this year. That um, I know there's some further consultations to be done between the CYA and the some of the national groups to come up with the, the mechanism and how it's going to work. My view is that you have to be at the apex of this. I think the CYA has to be at the top. You are going to be the main interlocutor. Uh, actually, the CIA, CIA was created many, many years ago for that pr express purpose. And it was recognized by the heads of government in the declaration that um, we should play that role. And I mean to give that reality. When I became Secretary General and I got my first briefing on the youth program and I realized that certain things were declared and, not, and action wasn't taking place, that's how I began to interact with the youth, at least to give that, that window of a voice. And I think it, is, it, is, it has established itself. And I think that there are some recommendations that have come on board that we have taken on board and moved forward with. So it may not be as much as you would wish to hear. I don't think I am, I am, I don't see you as a token at all. I think this very, very seriously. Thank I don't you. Think, I don't think you have the time or I have the time for us to be seeing that as a token. Um, if, if I'm not as successful as I would like to be, it's because sometimes the resources are not there. But um, you have my pledge that I will do as much as I can to ensure that this is not the case. I cannot speak of what happens at the national level. Right. I can't. And I can't speak about, there's very often a, a desire for everybody to reach in. 
um, it has to be coordinated. It has to be in a structured way. Uh, we're, we're about to do this with the private sector. We're about to do this with civil society. We're about to do this with labor. And youth is a partner in that, in that, in that, in that uh, amalgamation of having voices heard um, so that we can implement and advance our integration arrangements. I quite appreciate what you just said about including the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps within future plans because it actually le led up to my question after Mark. We discussed earlier that the youth dialogue is something that has been occurring for a while and we even give recommendations on changing the venue. Probably next time we'll do it by the you beach. You're on the beach, right? Right? <laughs> More youth friendly. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, you know, what what format would make it more targeted to youth? Because while we do appreciate the dialogue with you mm -hmm. here, there still may be a lot that might be lost in translation. Mm -hmm. There's only so many questions we can Correct. take. There are only so many online viewers who can attend. So if you had to change the format, and I know you're not technically youth, I'll classify you as age youth because you still work for us, <laughs> right? I use that hat. Exactly. <laughs> Senior youth, um, if you had to change the format to include more governmental support, maybe more private sector support to this type of dialogue, what would you, what would you suggest? I think, I think we shouldn't limit ourselves to just this dialogue. This happens once a year. I think it's how do we put in place a mechanism for, to allow for the constant interaction as we go right. forward, right? This is one manifestation of it. Call it, call it the culmination, the, 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 the high point of a given year. But in between, we have to be able to, to do this. And I've, I've done, I've done other, other out, outreaches, um, not in a studio setting. I was in a hotel room once, and I, I think the youth forced me to use Twitter for the first time. We did a Twitter relay. And the questions were coming in fast and furious. We communicated for a couple hours and then. And, and then when I visit um, member states and, and the opportunity presents itself, I do interact. But I think we have to sort of systema systematize it um, that we've also invited youth ambassadors to attend when there were youth ministers are meeting, ministers of youth okay. meeting at the regional level. <coughs> we've involved you in such programs that have a life, such as our PANCAP program, HIV and AIDS. Right. Your, your, your keen voice and an advocate. Um, I know we did a recent um, program with, with the CYAs in Trinidad and Tobago, I think. I'm a little bit hazy on dates, but either late last year or early this year we yes. did that. And that kind of activity is going to continue. So it has to be done at varying levels, but we have to be able to reach out in a coordinated way. And that's, that's why I think the mechanism that, that, that you propose, that we propose, is something that we really have to work on to see how we can get this working live. So I've heard you here in St. Lucia, Mark, speak about the National Youth Council and what's happening here. And how do we replicate that in other member states? And how do we feed all of that, 15 plus 5, 20 of that okay. sort of thing, into the CYA core, right? Okay. And then give that representation a voice at the appropriate forum where the policymakers sit and meet. You have access to me. I mean, I've never been asked by the Youth Ambassador Corps to meet, and I say no. I may not be able to do, do it on a particular day, but I always meet with you. You have an access to me, and that access is going to be there as long as I'm Secretary General. Wonderful. Um, and I'm open to other formats, as you put it, um, um, in, in terms of how we do the outreach. But I think we have to work with you on, on how we do this. We've, we've also had, um, and I recognize we have to do a little more um, coordination between the Youth Ambassador Corps and the Secretariat, the Youth Ambassador, Ambassador at the national level, and the other folk, CARICOM focal points in terms of the CSME, the CARICOM Ambassador. And these are discussions we've been having with the CARICOM ambassadors when we meet. So how do we put all of that together? So all of these efforts, all of these united efforts can result in moving forward as, as we go ahead. So I'm hopeful that we can do this. It's, it's, don't think this is a simple thing because coordination is not easy. You think about coordinating at the national level and multiply that by 20. Oh, wow. It's, it's not an easy thing. But we have to try. Yes. And we have to, make, we have to make progress where we can. And we have to identify the priority areas. When we started the core, I think we had identified three or four um, issues that we wanted the, the youth ambassador to, to promote, and, to, and then, and then the, the youth have been bringing their own issues now forward. We started off with the CSME and, and one or two others, and HIV and AIDS, and now the, the issues are expanding to your issues. How do we prioritize the issues and do that? Wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful response. I would now like to take any questions from our audience. Like I said, this is a dialogue and we're interacting with youth. Can we get the mic <coughs> over to this 
gentleman. To the first vice president of the National Youth Council, Mr. Naya Salford. Please let him introduce himself. <laughs> this man needs no introduction. This is the mayor of Chozel. <laughs> Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Um, Ambassador Rock, Mark Esri. Thank you for the invitation to this panel. Um, we're speaking about tokenism and we're speaking about the people. And I just want to bring up something which came up at the recent General Assembly meeting of the Commonwealth well, Caribbean Regional Youth Council. And I think that one of the reasons that if there is any question when it relates to tokenism is because often we see youth development or youth development work being sort of like a competition between the persons who are supposed to be um, working on behalf of young people and young people themselves. And we speak about the coordinating mechanism and I specifically remember that being brought up at the recent General Assembly of CRIP. And when it was brought up to the members, it was not something that was embraced, basically, because a lot of the things that the coordinating mechanism spoke to, that is actually supposed to be the role of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council. And we saw it a bit as duplication. So what I want to know from the ambassadors and from you, Ambassador Leroy, is how does CARICOM intend to work, instead of working aside from or apart from organizations that already basically do the same thing, how do we intend to work together to ensure that there is no duplication across the region? And I mean, I'll take the opportunity um, to probably send a proposal out there. Being a, a member of the organizing team of the Caribbean Youth Leaders Summit, that is supposed to happen in Barbados in November. Um, that is actually a space where CARICOM leaders, the persons who are in charge of the, the Caribbean Regional Youth Council, and probably me too, try to see ways in which we can collaborate instead of working against each other. Because at times that's what it seems like to me. Okay. I much appreciate the NAS. I want to try to respond. Go ahead. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Duplication must be avoided at all times. But there's a difference between duplication and coordination. And <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is that we have to coordinate. Now, what, what are the strengths or what are the opportunities that each of these, you mentioned the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth um, uh, Youth, Youth Council, and the work is being done. And now you, you mentioned that we are going to be doing it. What, we, what, I, what I've mentioned here is that the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps has access. We have to understand the governance arrangements in our community. We're creating a, Caricom, a Caribbean community. At the apex of that is the heads of government, the conference. Of that construct is the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps. That CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps has access through the Secretary General and, and hopefully in the future, perhaps direct. It has access. And it begs the question of how then do we see that as an opportunity to allow for that institutionalized access to reach out to the other mechanisms as being, uh, the mechanisms that you mentioned about, how do we bring them all together? So I'm not, I, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to go and create a new mechanism. As a matter of fact, I understand that when the discussion took place in January, um, they were supposed to be reaching out to a number of other groups. Okay. I, that's my understanding based on the report that I got. And that would come back together, hopefully for another, I imagine another sitting, I guess um, we'll have to work that out. And then come up with some structure. What I am saying here is that let us not reinvent the wheel, as you said. The CARICOM Youth Ambassador coexists. There's a CARICOM Youth Ambassador, there are two CARICOM Youth Ambassadors in every member state, and I think in most of the associate member states, if not all. And as I said, there already is that apex mechanism for getting the voice to a point where it can be heard at a regional level. So let's see how we utilize that. Let us see, don't, don't see it as duplicating, let us see how we can utilize the opportunities where they exist to allow that voice to be heard. I have to agree with you and I have to agree with Nias as well. I think every CARICOM Youth Ambassador within every country is willing to work with every youth group. I just think that a lot of the time we're not aware, completely aware of the power that you say we have, the access that you say we have because of maybe how the program is established mm -hmm. or how the mechanisms run in every country. But I think that this should serve as an eye opener. And yes, feel free to call on me. I am here. I am willing, Nias, to work with anyone and everyone as long as it's for the betterment of youth development. Well, I want to touch on the, um, the contribution made by Mr. Alfred. Uh, this is definitely a conversation that we have had before. Even amongst the colleagues who attended the consultation at the Secretariat in January, we did consider all of these things. 
Um, I can remember a colleague from St. Vincent actually mentioned that what we are trying to do is essentially already in existence, somewhat. It's just that there are not particulars that are highlighted. What needs to happen is that we need to work on housekeeping in terms of actually ensuring that what we are doing is actually conducive to the other in terms of not competing with the, our fellow youth practitioners, um, in terms of coordinating as well on the national level. Because as SB is correctly saying, there's no reason that the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors cannot collaborate with the National Youth Council as well as the National Student Council when, of course, our mandates overlap. There's no reason why we should not be able to do that. Right? However, if it is not institutionalized or standardized in one instance, for example, then we would end up in a situation where it becomes chaotic. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that has actually led to the circumstance that Naya has highlighted where it seems to be a competition. Right, which actually takes us to one of our but before you move back, can I ask, can I say, because I understand that the, the, the Commonwealth arrangement has certain strengths in terms of in doing training for leadership and certain things of that nature, if, my, my, if I'm correct. So that is, a, that is a strength that they have that we don't have at the Secretariat, because we don't have the resources. But the CIA has a strength that needs to be recognized equally. So while we, in the scheme of things, recognize that we have to tap into that to allow for all our CIAs to be exposed and so on and to have allow for greater coordination, I think that other mechanism needs to recognize what can be the role of the, of the, of the CIA. You know, the CIA role is going, CIA's role is going to be more, more a perspective from a, uh, from a regional perspective, mm -hmm. while some of the other work that's being done is more of a national. So I think, I think there's a lot of room for coordination, a lot of room. And I think we just have to try and work it through. Agreed. Mm -hmm. We have a question down at the front. Yeah, I'm LeSean Dennis um, okay. from Tasha Central Community Liaison. Uh, I just want to say, just listening here, is that um, I'm seeing to myself the whole tokenism of that communication is a big problem for all the, uh, the member states. And that is something I believe that should be enhanced and also that um, the youth that are representing the youth overseas and throughout the Caribbean uh, must take on themselves that is, this is not a, basically like a personal thing or, or a self thing for self gratitude, but actually it's for the, the entire youth and, and anything like that. So when you go, when when um, youth go out um, on speak on a regional level or a national level, um, most times you'll not find that they'll have weight because. A lot of um, the topics they come up with and speak about is not even relevant throughout the communities itself. And a lot of um, youth are not even attached to what is happening within the different organizations and whatnot and whatnot. So I believe that it's not really um, tokenism, but it's really communication. And people uh, have to realize that it is not um, a self thing, but it's for actually what is happening throughout the Caribbean with the youth. Excellent. Thank Wonderful. You. Another question towards the back. My statement is more or along the lines of especially what uh, Mr. Laroc said in relation to the role of the CYAs in taking the issues and the, um, the situations on the ground level and taking it up to the CARICOM level. Um, I think if we are to realize that goal, then the program seriously needs to be resourced a lot much than it's being resourced right now. And through coordination, um, through getting the buy-in from CARICOM heads that this is a worthwhile program. We have CYAs who are excellent on the ground level, but there's not much coordination where we could say that CYAs have an office in the Department of Youth or CYAs have an office in the, the Office of the National Youth Council. I think if we're looking at getting these young people to take the issues of our CARICOM youth up to heads of government, then definitely we need to find a creative way of getting the buy-in because at present it doesn't look like the youth ambassador, sorry, the, yeah, the CARICOM youth ambassadors program is a major priority for heads of government right now. But yeah, I, I think I think we have to look at at, at how there's there's been a period where there's been a bit of a lull. Okay, L let's 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 agree on that. But I think we have to we have to see how we use the limited resources that we have to do what we have because the resources are limited, and I always say resources go where it recognizes value added is going to, to be realized. So if you know that you're gonna get something out of something, you put your time, your effort, your resources into it. That applies almost across everything that we do. Almost every work that I do in the Secretariat, if it is not resourced, 
and people don't see the value in it and wasting time and the resource is not going to go afterwards. So we have, to, we have to look at that and see how we, um, how we build the value added that the, first of all, you, the youth, have to recognize and we have to communicate, I accept that point, communicate the value, the potential value of the Youth Ambassador Corps to you. And then we have to be able to communicate upwards and then we have to give the channel for it to, to go through. Okay. There's a number of things that we have to put in place. Um, in some of the member states, the youth ambassadors are very active. Um, sometimes they're resourced, sometimes they're just creative. I've met some youth ambassadors have been really creative um, in getting things done. Um, maybe perhaps because of the particular location they may be in at a particular point in time. But I think we need to be able to harmonize and, and and I know sometimes we onboard, we, we, we have youth ambassadors and we don't do sufficient enough to, to onboard the youth ambassadors in terms of what is the role, how we could communicate, right. how we could support each other. I am aware of that and we're gonna, have to, we're gonna be addressing that already. And when Michelle and I met, we discussed those issues, some of the priority areas that we have to look at. And already she's beginning to look at some of those things. How do we equip you, how do we, so how do we give you the visibility as well? Mm -hmm. and, and that is the value added that you bring. Mm -hmm. And how do we get our member states to recognize that you have that role to play? The member states have recognized the, the, there's a CARICOM ambassador to each member state, from each member state to CARICOM. They recognize that CARICOM ambassador. How do I get the CARICOM ambassador and the youth ambassador to work together so that you are, you are, uh, you are part of and parcel of that, uh, of that effort going forward? There are three focal points, really. It's you, for the youth, there's the CSME focal point, and there's the CARICOM youth ambassador. The CARICOM, the, sorry, the, um, CARICOM, the CARICOM ambassadors. Yeah. The CARICOM ambassadors, I met with them I met them a couple weeks ago and the, the lament was, we don't have resources, we don't have resources, we want to do this, we want to do that, we don't have resources. That was the lament of the ambassadors themselves. Mm -hmm. in terms. So it's the same thing, how do, we, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we do what we can with the limited resources here by being focused and prioritize the issues, I think is a big challenge that we're gonna have and recognize the value added that we can, we can bring, bring, bring to the fore both, both ways. Um, um. I can speak for myself, I may not be able to speak for all the CYAs watching right now, hello out there, but we do appreciate Miss, well she doesn't like me to call her Miss, but Michelle sure. Small Bartley becoming part of our team and she has been working, messaging, asking questions, finding out what we need, what we want to see happening and we do appreciate that both of you are coordinating to help improve the program because we don't want to see it disintegrate no. and just fall by the wayside for us to be just known as oh she was a CARICOM youth ambassador yeah but she didn't really do anything we don't want that to happen she's not going to allow that to happen anyway. i know she's not <laughs> I, I can already tell she's not going to allow that to happen yeah. but yes we do mm. recognize her work even though she's just started and we do appreciate it mm. um just letting everyone know out there we are accepting online questions UETV is here, and we have our streaming occurring on our CARICOM <coughs> Youth website, so if, on Facebook, sorry. So if you have questions that you need to ask, please don't hesitate to send it in. Do we have any other audience members? Okay. I'm asking. I'm asking on behalf of, the, of Jairo Rodriguez from the online platform. His Excellency said the Secretariat doesn't have the resources to build leadership for CYA. Mm -hmm. His question is, what is or what does the Secretariat intend to do about this? You can't have an officer without an office. If it is the local youth office to find such resources, what can CARICOM do to ensure this? I think what I, what I was trying to say, if I didn't say it correctly, is that the, the Commonwealth program provides leadership training. Is, am I correct? Is what one of the programs I understand that they have and they've had it for many years. Yeah. We don't have the resources to do that. And why should we do that mm -hmm. if resources are limited when somebody else is doing it? Why don't we coordinate to get it done collectively? Mm -hmm. That's the message I was trying to, to get together. And, and so we recognize where the value added, recognize the strengths that we have as a, with the CYA, resource that particular strength adequately from our standpoint, the other, stand, the other organizations that have their particular strengths, resource that adequately, and break, so that for the, the res, so you don't spread any resources too thin. It's being channeled where the priorities are, where the strengths are, and bring them together. And that's the message I was trying to, now there's a certain minimum of, res, minimum of resources that any CARICOM youth ambassador would wish, would wish to have, you know, to allow them to, to function, I accept that. But I was making a, a particular reference to 
the strength that I heard coming out of the Commonwealth Youth Program. So your take on the sharing of resources is sort of like what PANCAP is doing, giving us training on HIV AIDS, Precisely. advocacy and so on. Yeah. So they are, it's like killing two birds if one stone. Yeah. We're working with them and then it's a so we can work. Precisely. And then for instance, because of the PANCAP has a strength mm -hmm. in doing that particular leadership on HIV and AIDS and, and, and that sort of thing, I would suggest that anybody else who wants to do it should tap into the PANCAP program as a sting from duplicating it. And others who are doing other kinds of leadership program, we tap into that program. I think that's the kind of coordination we need to bring together. Okay. Uh, if I'm just to chime in, uh, what I'm gathering from a couple of the contributions made both by our audience as well as you, Ambassador and Nesby, um, reminds me of another statement that was actually brought up at the Secretariat in January, where it was said that for there to be effective use of scarce resources, then two things are key. That is collaboration and cooperation. Right? In terms of what Mr. LeBon mentioned, in terms of the office space and the National Youth Council and the CYA is working together, I'm not sure if many persons would realize, but um, it's actually mentioned in the CYA handbook that mm -hmm. the CYAs and the National Youth Councils are supposed to work hand in hand in terms of actually working on the grounds and then bringing the issues and the, the solutions as well, the initiatives, the proactive initiatives. Because I feel like sometimes we, we think about youth affairs as, as issues most times. They are very proactive youth um, projects and programs that have been implemented and um, you know have been executed both on a national and regional level and I think we should just help to raise awareness for. Even in terms of the question that was raised by the, the contributor online, simply setting out the guidelines or setting out the parameters that would say the National Youth Council or the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors are to have access to the National Youth Council's office, for example, or the National Youth Council and the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors are to work together to plan certain initiatives. Mm -hmm. doesn't, have, doesn't mean that the CYA should be involved in every single affair of the NYC. However, at key times or for certain um, issues or initiatives, then they, there should be some kind of um, cooperation. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question at the front. Yes, um, uh, a question from an online contributor, Celia Davidson Francis. She's the regional coordinator of the Restart Ambassador Corp. Um, and she's saying, before, before I ask the question, she's saying that the 2010 Declaration of Prime Maribo on the future of youth in the Caribbean community, where the heads of government declared that they would develop a mechanism. So she's saying um, the heads of government declared that they would develop a mechanism for the sustained and structured involvement of youth in decision-making process of the community. Very important for mechanisms for this, imp for this implemented. You would start with like to be involved, especially re climate change. And her question is, what are the specific processes or mechanisms that carry come via the CYA is doing to make this a reality? Marcus, I think you were, you were, I think one of the groups that we, are, we identified that has to be part of that coordinating mechanism, there's, there's the UE stand and there's a, there's a third one which escapes me right now. I believe it was Saipan. Sorry? Saipan. Yes, which would have to work, we would work the CYA with those yeah. two groups to begin to, to, to do the coordination. So there is a role for UE stat in, in this process. I know UE stat has reached out to us and in my communication with them at that point in time, and I met with them in Jamaica, was that we have to w see how we work together, recognizing, of course, again, once again, I gotta put a plug for my CYAs, what the CYAs did, but we're very open to working, and as a matter of fact, <coughs> the UE start is recognized as going to be, because they reach out regionally as well. Mm -hmm. They reach out across not just the campuses, but when, this, when the, the alumni reach out as well. So we have, a, we have that matrix of, of um, reaching out. Mm -hmm. um, any questions, any more questions? Ambassadors? We have a question here from Suriname. They are asking if the first youth agenda can be proposed for the CARICOM heads meeting in February 2020. Ooh, very nice question. I can't commit to that, but I think we have. <laughs> no, you see, if I give you a promise that I don't commit to, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna hang, hang me by my neck. I told you that when we met, when we met in January. We committed to trying to get it to to here. Mm -hmm. We haven't reached here because there's a body of work to be done still. Once that body of work is done, 
once that body of work is done, and it's not going to be done at the Secretariat alone, my body secretary will be coordinating that work. It has to be done throughout the region, the outreach. Once that work is done, I promise you you'll get that access to the, co the, the Conference of the Government agenda. If it's February, it's done by February, it will happen in February. So let's work towards it, but I can't say it's going to happen in February. In other words, the work has to be, I can't go to the heads with work as incomplete. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Complete the work, Michelle, we're going to complete the work. We aim for February. If not, then it's going to slide. That's the commitment I can make. Let's complete the work. Because there was a body of work set out to be done that has to be done. As I said, Michelle only came on board in May, so we had a little bit of a break in between. She's back on board, and we've heard that she's reaching out. So let's see what we can do. Questions? Any more questions? <coughs> OK. Um, I know that it's a lot. 20 countries, 15 members, five associated states. It is a lot of heads, different ideas, different perspectives of the, what youth should be allowed to do or participate mm -hmm. in or the decision making processes they should navigate. But I'm thinking of St. Lucia because we're in St. Lucia right now and 90% of the room is St. Lucia. Um, what do you think we as youth should be doing more of to ensure that successive governments of our country are held accountable to the commitments they have made and signed off to as, as, yeah, as yeah. TYAs, as National Youth Councils and so on? Advocacy. The more, the more you advocate for what you want. If you're silent, you don't get anything. If you're coordinated in your advocacy to ensure continuity, not, not a lot of voices, a lot of noises, coordinated advocacy works. Consistent, coordinated advocacy. Put the, put the three of them together. Um, I feel that the, 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 I, I view you as part of a constituency, a regional constituency. Okay. All right? The people of the Caribbean are part of a regional constituency. I can do all of the work that I have to do in the CARICOM Secretariat, and unless the people of the community see value in it, unless they demand of their various authorities that is going to benefit them and put it in place, and unless I can convince, of course, the government themselves that it's going to add value to what they're doing, it's not going to get done. So it's consistent, coordinated advocacy. You as a constituent out there for the youth, mm -hmm. it's a formidable voice. It's a formidable voice if you can coordinate the youth of the region. To, to try to get action in a coordinated way. Hmm. Not a voice for noise. A voice not for a change. noisy voice. <laughs> not a noisy voice. Not a lot of din in the room, but a coordinated, sustained advocacy. Let me ask. Mm. Last question. Right. Just very briefly. Um, since, as we mentioned, there are, and I mentioned as well, there are frameworks that have already been signed on and agreed to, and there are proclamations. The declaration speaks to commitments that were made by governments in 2010. We are in 2019, and we have observed that there have been some strides. We have seen that some governments have kept to the commitments. However, we are also seeing shortcomings, as we mentioned. Um, I think what the question really was pointed at is, are there no ramifications, or are there no, yeah. no sanctions? Sanctions. Okay. Not for no. no. Our community doesn't have sanctions in that sense. Right. You already have to advocate and persuade and so on. Okay. However, why is it necessary to advocate for something that was already committed to? Well, you, we advocated, okay, the, the declaration took place in, in Suriname in 2010. If you all didn't keep on reminding, we wouldn't have reached where we have reached up till now, you know. When the, when the, Param the, summit, the, the youth summit took place in Paramaribo in 2010, mm -hmm. and I came on board and I heard what happened. I was not present. I heard what happened in Paramaribo. And I heard the dissatisfaction of the youth. And I realized that I had to do something with whatever limited resource that I had. Um, but if, if you all did not, if the youth did not do anything and say anything, we would not even reach where we are. Sometimes things take a, have a long, I know, I know that we all want to see things happen overnight, and I do too. I get very impatient with, even, even at the Secretariat in terms of how long things get, take to get, take to, to get done. I, I tell you so honestly. But if you're not, if you're not consistent and, try and persistent and working on things, your voice doesn't get heard, but it has to be in a channeled way. And it doesn't apply only to the youth, you know. When we advocate as a, as a community over I internationally, as 15 voices, you have to, you, you, 
you will understand the word yen yen in yes. St. Lucia. <laughs> and our colleagues in Dominica will understand the word yen yen. It's, it's a pesky little fly. <laughs> I'm not asking you to be pesky, but uh, you have to be persistent in a coordinated way. And I keep saying in a coordinated way because we have been making strides as a community, if I may just digress momentarily, on certain issues that pertain to small island developing states or peculiarities and the need for resilience. But it's, it's a long haul, and you have to count your... your, your I, know, I know we're all impatient because you're not going to be used forever. Uh, you'll soon be joining me on this, and then somebody will be asking you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> somebody will be asking you the questions. But we have to keep on, keep on keeping on at it, and don't give up. Thank you. Don't give up. Thank you. Um, mm. We're going to be taking a quick break, but I just want to summarize what you last said and remind our youth to be a persistent... Not pesky, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am a child. I am HIV positive. I am a Muslim. I'm a journalist. I am gay. I am a political activist. I am differently abled. I am Chinese. And me, I'm a little plus size. The first step toward change is awareness. The second step is acceptance of individuality and differences within all of us. A message brought to you by the Department of Health and Wellness. Attend. Est-ce que vous savez, ici un crime pour voler de l'eau? Ça c'est voler les hommes pour asco et pour attirer qui capte. Aussi, impossible pour saler le système de l'eau. Si de l'eau a mon coupé ou pas si posé, bah il mon a de l'eau. Ou ça joue un charge 5000 dollars et ben 12 mois de calabouse là. Si au coupé de l'eau, qu'y est nous à son numéro 4773900 et ben vini à office Wasco en Landshoot. Viens fort et souffrez pour parler avec vous. Ça c'est en commission Rod Wasco. So I'll tell you about this afterwards. Okay, thank you, and we are back. We will be discussing our second thematic area, which is regional integration, regional travel, and entrepreneurship. I'm going to do a brief overview. I'm sorry if I bore you in advance, but we're going to start from the top. We know the Caribbean community, CARICOM, is a large organization. We've said it's made up of 15 member states, five associated states. Now, the mission of the organization is to deepen integration and resilience to realize our Caribbean human potential, to create an environment of innovation, to develop technology, and to increase productivity and competitiveness, and also to increase savings and investment within our region. Now, CARICOM has long come to the consensus that integration would allow our countries to enjoy economies of scale which would allow them to increase productivity, diversify their output, and in the end, boost economic growth. Now, one of the surest ways of ensuring integration would be an efficient transport system within member states. However, the community has been faced with the challenge of establishing this efficient transport system due to operational limitations, geographical range of the islands, and they've been fighting for this since 1996. That's as far back as my research took me. I may be no. wrong. Now, a great push was made at the Heads of Government meeting in 2017, an ambassador, you were there, to get governments to sign off the Multilateral Air Services Agreement, which would assist in charting a way for easier regional travel through CARICOM. And the agreement would ensure that CARICOM air carriers have fair and equal opportunities to compete in regional air transportation. Now, unfortunately, a lack of support for the agreement, coupled with increased taxes and charges and fares imposed on air travelers, mm -hmm. have 
agitated members of the community, to put it lightly. Okay, it has agitated some so far as they've started an online petition. I'm sure some of you have seen it. I voted. Um, now, community members are rightfully worried about unaffordable transportation. They're rightfully worried about the limitations that travel will have in accessing goods, services, tourism, niche markets, and of course, the ability for youth to engage, generate, and participate in meaningful employment. Now, in St. Lucia, we have many young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We all know Johan and Dujon, so I don't even need to extend more on him. He was the creator of Aglas Organics. I said that right, right? Mm -hmm. We have some smaller known people, Dion Carey and Koch Jewelry. I believe they make personalized jewelry. Mm -hmm. We have Healthy Strand 758, who produces natural hair products. And these young people have sought to combat the unemployment situation by paving and charting their own way. Now, as their businesses continue to grow, it is obvious that they may long to reach outside the island and branch out to other territories within our region. Concerns exist with the nature and the state of our region's air travel at the moment. So how can CARICOM ensure, or can CARICOM ensure that business entrepreneurs are not limited in their scope for, e for economical regional growth? Okay, you've, you've have, you have a number of things rolled up into that introduction. I so have to I'm try, try my to best. <laughs> but you've done it quite well. I'm going Thank to try you. to see why you've connected them quite well, but I'm going to have to dissect them a little bit now to re and then reassemble them. Go ahead. The multilateral air services agreement, which you referred to, um, would have replaced a previous one that we had. We had a multilateral air services agreement that, that was signed <coughs> after the 1996 period before we went into the single market, the CSME. It right. was not consistent with the revised Treaty of Chagram. So we right. had to renegotiate mm -hmm. it and make it more consistent. Mm -hmm. Basically what it says is that we have an open skies agreement in our community. So that um, and when it becomes operational, and I think we're very close, we need a certain number of signatures. I'm hoping that I can get it, keep our fingers crossed, at this meeting. I, I think my, one of my staff said we may have that done this week. It's here for further signature it then becomes operational. What it does among the member states, it, 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 it's easier for smaller aircraft airlines to gain access into the individual markets of the member states. So you're creating one air market. Right. And to the extent that some of our regional airlines um, are having challenges in servicing some routes, it may just be possible that, that some airlines may start off small by just going to two points and bridge a gap there. And it allows, the whole idea behind that is to allow <coughs> for, for small operators to come in um, and to bridge that gap. So there's that aspect of freeing up the, the, air skies, the, the airspace to allow for, for a greater market in, in air service. Mm -hmm. then, then comes the other issue of cost. The fact that, we, that uh, given our geographic location, as one, one air airline <coughs> expert explained to me, the model for these, for that LIAT for instance has. You know, it's not a, it's a it's a costly model, and not because that necessarily because of, an I of of inherent inefficiency. Some say that is the case, but it's because of the model. You have short takeoffs and landing, takeoff and landing, and and that in itself has built-in cost structures in it, and so on. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is where you have the smaller commuters um, able to do that. So I don't know what can be done about the cost. At the same time, there are the taxes, the taxes on on the airline ticket, but then there are the demands on the governments to upgrade the airports and even to build new airports where they don't right. exist. And where do the resources come from? So these are, these are some of the issues that I know that the heads of government grapple with. Transportation is, is an issue that is receiving almost constant attention in that, in that sense. We've actually looked at issues put into establishing a ferry service. Um, we did some work on that some years ago and when we did the analysis of previsibility, it was required a substantial subsidy from the member states to allow it to happen in the region of five million US dollars for just six months. And, and then there will, be, there will be need for attendant um, infrastructure development at the member state level if you want to deal with roll on roll off because mm -hmm. it was noticed that um, if you want to make it viable with cargo and passengers, you may have to have roll on roll off and that sort of thing. It's back on, the, back on the agenda again. I say on the agenda, back for us to look at it one more time because something may prove not feasible now, but down the road it becomes feasible for, for technological reasons, reasons and whatnot. Right. I mean, solar energy is a case in point. When we started talking about solar energy, it was prohibitive. Now it's, a, it's something that's very affordable. So we're back, that is back on, on track. And then the other aspect of, of travel is what we call hassle-free travel. When we, wh I am a Suriname and Guyana in the, in the southernmost 
part of the Caribbean, and I, well, I, that's where I, I resided. When we have to travel throughout the region, if you're going to go up to St. Kitts, you have to go through security four and five times. Mm -hmm. Right. And we address, we're trying to address that because what it is that our security standards are not harmonized across the region. Right. Yeah. So we began a discussion to see how we can harmonize the security standards um, so that you know that if you board an aircraft, you pass through a security checkpoint in country A, mm -hmm. that is the standard that will obtain in country B on your way to country C so that they may not be necessary for that. And the other issue is, again, that the international, when you travel internationally, then the commingling of regional passengers and international. and international is not something that is encouraged because, you know, then the security issues Truth emerge. Me. Those of you who go to Trinidad, you'll see that Trinidad has a separate terminal for travel right. to Tobago, assisting from other CARICOM countries. But has attempted to do this with the, with the LIAT. So these are some of the issues that have to be looked at. Some of them are structural to airports. And some of them are, are, are more like trying to see how you could, you could work on it. All of these things we're trying to work on. So that is the, the travel thing. Travel is one of the most difficult things I've ever had to deal with in the Secretariat. I tell everybody that. It's something that, you know, and then there's the small, this, this small vessel service for, for, um, for cargo as well. That, that is something that we have to look at because they play a very, a very excellent role in moving produce, especially among the islands, the short haul with agricultural right. products. And, and how do you call I know the OECS, for instance, is doing quite a bit of work on the on the small vessels um, and, and the standards and whatnot that is trying to and we 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 are very much aware of that and we see how we can collaborate in those areas. So that is the body of work that is being done there. How do you make? Because some people tell me it's more it, it's easier for them to get in, to buy a ticket to go to Miami than to buy a ticket say, from the south of the Caribbean and go up to Belize or to go up to to, 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 to other places and, and, and so. And you you really you really need an efficient and affordable transportation um, sector to build onto an, an integration. So the issue is not a simple one. And, and we, we, we've been hearing the, the, the different um, about Liat, and, and I don't know what would happen if Liat were not around. I, I'm, I'm being honest with you. Mm -hmm. Liat is providing a service. I know sometimes we get annoyed and so on, but Liat is providing a service. We bought Liat um, without to reinvent Liat, without to have another sort of regional commuter airline that, that can do the work. And I know that the, the shareholder governments are looking at it very, very seriously to see how we can get it back on board. So that's one aspect of it. Now, the other aspect is the movement of, of young entrepreneurs to mm -hmm. ply the trade. Right. And what we have in place um, is the big term, nice term, right of establishment. Basically, what it means in the treaty is that mm -hmm. a national of the community of one member state has the right to get into another member state and establish a business once right. he or she meets certain criteria of establishing. You're not just going there and say you're going to establish and you go down <coughs> line. You have to really go and establish a business, no matter how big and small it is. And then we have other categories to allow for persons to move as well, persons who are professionals who may be able to go and seek, seek work. So that's an opportunity. Because the whole, the whole thing behind this is that in any one country, um, you, you put it right, the, the economies of scale may not be there, but in a wider community, it's there. Mm -hmm. And it allows for it to work. Now, there's, it's, it's there, it's working, and there's, there's some hiccups as well. I'm not going to say there are no hiccups. There are hiccups, and you hear about the hiccups, but you don't hear about the those success. that, that the, the successes, you don't hear about it. Because you get stopped at one airport and it makes the news. But the other the else that go through, and I've met persons who tell me, well, they have a little business there and they have a business there. I met a young, a young chap once, a very young fellow, and he was doing fairly well. And I said to him, well, what is your business? He says he was, um, he was a draftsman, he was drawing plans. I said, and where's your market? He says, the region. I said, what do you mean the region? Do you move around? He says, no, I have my computer. I market ah. myself, I give him my samples of what I can do, I do everything by a, and his marketing, his, no, not everything you can do that way. Right. But e-commerce is something that we have to look at as well. How do, we, how do we bridge the divide with e-commerce? Or does a particular business that you're doing lend itself, so lend itself to that? Um, you mentioned the, the, the entrepreneur here on the, on, on, on the seaweed, I f forgive me, I, I forget his name. Johanna seaweed. I met him at um, Caribbean Week of Agriculture um, in Barbados, where he exhibited his wares. He had a lot of persons coming and inquiring, because not only is he, does he have something to sell, he is providing a solution to a problem. problem right. So that, that's, a double, that's a double thing there. He's providing an organic base for growing <coughs> pr products, and then he's pr providing a solution. So we're using what other means we have to allow for young entrepreneurs through Caribbean Export as well. Caribbean Export has programs. I think they want to start another one that would also allow for young entrepreneurs to apply their trade. 
We're looking at areas in the cultural industries where I know that our youth excel in the cultural, various aspects of the cultural industries that mm -hmm. will include animation and, and the arts and so on. Okay. So these are all various areas we're looking to seek to promote and to allow those persons to move and apply their trade. Um, we have 10 categories that have been approved. The heads of now have asked us to look at two additional categories, agriculture, workers, and um, security, security um, personnel. personnel. Not Wonderful. security guards, but security personnel, personnel, which means that there are going to be standards. And if you're a security personnel, you're a security personnel. You're not that falling asleep at the gate <laughs> <laughs> and so on. We all have that in our region. <laughs> we know what it's like. So as we expand those categories, and as they are recognized and enshrined in the laws of the member states, not, not, all, not all the member states have passed the laws. And that is where you now, as, as a consistent, coordinated advocacy, urge your governments to pass the categories into law. We can, we can draft the laws, but we need your voices to help us to get them to pass the law. Some have passed seven, eight, nine, ten, but there are some only passed five. So, so we need that, and that enshrines your right. Your right. Now you asked about sanctions. I'm not advocating that, but that's what the CCG was created for. If, if the rights of a citizen is not adhered to, that person can have access at least to some sort of redress. And we know that some persons have used it in the past. I'm not advocating we all go to court because it's very expensive and whatnot. But that's where the advocacy comes up as well. And that's where you, in trying to create the market um, to allow for, for persons to apply their trade in a genuine and, 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 and proper manner. Um, that's, that's, that's it. So what we do, what we try to do at, uh, from, from a secretariat standpoint, from the standpoint of, is to, is to assist in creating the environment by doing the policies and the laws that would allow for those things to happen, the, 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 the legal infrastructure. And that's, what, that's the role that we play. But the implementation takes place at the member states level. Okay, thank you. Any questions from you, McAllister? No. Any questions from our audience? No questions from our audience? Uh, you were so thorough. Yeah. Um, uh, um, for the, um, the Caribbean integration problem and travel and whatnot, um, despite everything, um, the, the ferry service is the most economically um, thing because you know shipping is the most cheapest way to um, mm -hmm. ship cargo and people around the world. More, more, um, and the airlines it could be a bit expensive. Uh, I believe um, the, the Caribbean region is a very strategic region for the whole world economy. Mm -hmm. But our leaders have not seen that um, as very viable. Remember, like, we have to pass through the Panama Canal, the Caribbean Sea, to enter the Panama Canal, which makes navigation very short. And for, for the young entrepreneurs um, across the Caribbean, you have been stifled for a lot of, bureaucr um, a lot of government um, bureaucracy and also government changing every now and then. So every time a government change at the end of the, the term, the policies change, um, people are supporting that government change, then then us now will be left in, in that in that trap. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when they said, let Guyana be the best basket of the Caribbean and let us really integrate the Caribbean as a as a functioning unit like the new, let's say the European Union and, and stuff like that. And we have the ability to do that. Um, I know you say that um, the ferry service is a challenge. I think we should go ahead with that challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah. okay? Because for the long run, it will benefit us mm -hmm. the, in the Caribbean. Um, just, just recently, Martinique has a, um, put on another ferry service from here to St. Lucia. So in, in all in all, Liat maybe you might, might think um, the Caribbean, the, the, air, the air viable <laughs> might not work, but um, shipping through um, um, the, the ferry service, the sea, it will always be the cheapest way. It has always been the cheapest way, and that is what has to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. McAllister wants to respond and then we'll take your question. All right, LaShawn. So I'd just like to say I appreciate the, the contribution. Um, earlier this year, in February, I was able to attend the ECCB's third Growth and Resilience Dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's very similar to what you're saying in terms of um, the discussion sometimes that happen at these dialogues. Sometimes it's, it's really not relevant to the youth. Or you try to advocate or you try to inform persons of it and they're not particularly interested. However, that topic actually was one of those that came out. And for the first time, well, what we were told is that this was the first time that that information was being put out in a forum like that, that the ferry service was attempted, as you were saying, in terms of um, the schematics behind it, in terms of um, the logistics and the costing, the challenges that are very um, relevant. It is definitely, um, how do I put it, 
a task to achieve. Um, there are certain issues with it in terms of actually convincing the heads as well as getting um, persons on the grounds on in the various territories to understand the value or the impact of travel within the region because even if you just show up with a ferry service tomorrow and say this is, a, this is available, how do we convince nationals to go across? How do I convince somebody from Anguilla to come down to St. Lucia when we know that at this stage, in as much as we would like it, we are not integrated enough as a region. Persons do not understand the value of, of actually interacting within, within the um, CARICOM. Um, I definitely agree with you that it is still something that needs to be worked on, but it needs to be worked on from multiple <coughs> angles. And it's, it's something that needs a multilateral approach, mm -hmm. where you now begin sensitization and informing everybody from the young to the old in terms of the importance of, of regional integration, integration, the opportunities for entrepreneurship, as well as the School. importance for education and all of these things, right? And then if we can guarantee that we have a base where the revenue, the funds that would be generated would be able to match or even exceed the, the expenditure, the cost to actually get it done, then we'll be in a better position to actually execute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mathias. I think, I think, I think um, again, the, the time we are looking at, we're going to look at it again. And, and not only that, there, there's, there's private sector interest. When we looked at it at that time, it was just pure government looking at it. And um, obviously, you know, the, the, the startup capital and, and, the, and the subsidies. Now there are persons, um, there were before and they'll come back again, not the same persons, but persons have expressed an interest in, in once again looking at it. And we're going we're gonna to work with them. You mentioned, you mentioned the ferry service that is, that is, that is in, from St. Lucia to Martinique. Um, and similarly, from, you can catch the ferry from, from St. Lucia and go all the way up to Guadeloupe. Okay. Yeah, you go from here, St. Martinique, Dominica. When it started, when it started in, in, in the very, very early 90s, it was just two short hops, Guadalupe, Dominica, and back. It wasn't even going down because you had to get the, the client base used to doing that. And then the client base was built and then and so on. Because one of the things that we found out that you, you, you point to, Mark, is that at that time, persons in their minds were not thinking about ferry. It's a fast one hour hop or 20 minute hop or 40, 40 minutes hop and not thinking about a ferry. Now I think it's, it's growing on us. And the other thing from logistics we have to work out is that it lends itself easier to some, between some destinations. The proximity between St. Lucia and Martinique lends itself. Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, the proximity, capital capital from Port of Spain to, to um, Georgetown, will take eight hours, Whoa. eight hour ferry ride. Whoa. That's what we, we, we calculated. And, and, from, and, and to, to Suriname even more. It doesn't look like it's much on a map, but when you have to traverse that ocean, mm -hmm. it's quite a bit. So some sectors might lend itself more readily, and then you grow it out until you can. Those of us in the room who are not youth would remember the federal maple and the federal palm. <laughs> my first visit to St. Lucia, my mother put me on the federal maple in Dominica, and a relative here picked me by the port. I left Dominica in the morning, in the night, I, I landed here. It was a boat. There were two gifts from the Canadian government. And that's how we traveled in those days. You couldn't afford. You boarded that boat and you went on holidays in one of the other islands. So, but we forgot about that when the federal people and the federal parliament out of business. Now we're looking to see now, has this time come once again? Um, mm -hmm. I like that, but we also need to consider, even between that eight hour, between the two countries, there is room for entertainment that Precisely. you can provide. That's Precisely. You know, bring your, your stuff on. on. Exactly. Yeah. Exa make it a mini cruise. Exactly. We had a question in the corner and then we'll take Nias after. But he had a question first. Good evening. Uh, Nixon Barry, you are uh, the um, Let me, I'm wondering, what or who decides um, what to add a category on the CSM? There's no fixed formula. It, it comes up usually from, from, from a government, a member state, um, making a suggestion for whatever reason. And I'm saying this based on the backdrop that uh, we are here at a youth, a youth forum in a sense. And um, quite a lot has been said about youth development over the years by many leaders. And um, I'm wondering, why haven't youth development uh, been a category? Yeah. 
<laughs> why has a new development come up as a possible category? Because there are a lot of talks, especially from Commonwealth and perhaps CARICOM, about the professionalization of youth work. Mm -hmm. Even UWI is offering the, the youth development degree, mm -hmm. and Car Commonwealth would have done um, the diploma and so forth from Georgetown um, back in the day. So I'm wondering if we are moving beyond tokenism and we are moving really to uplift youth through the Caribbean. Why hasn't that been part of the agenda? How can it become part of the agenda? It, 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 in an in a indirect way, it probably is already. You mentioned, you mentioned UE is offering a degree and anybody with a degree has a right to move. So you have, you have categories of skills, but you also have um, college graduates of recognized universities, of which UE is one. So if you have a, U, a degree from UE, um, then, then you can graduate in certain areas, you can move. I think that's how it works. Yeah. Huh? No, yes. Graduates, yes, graduates. Yeah. Can we get a mic over here? So, so, it, you, so you can move, but, but the reason why skill sets were identified was to allow for, for certain skills to move, to move for employment and job creation and so on. And we started small. You go to the treaty, there are only five categories there. And over the years, we've expanded, we've expanded it. And now we've reached, well, 10 is actually supposed to be enforced, and two more we're working on, possibly a third one, which is still being negotiated by, because the member states have to find agreement. So okay. I won't mention the third, the third one yet to make it 13. We have a question from the gentleman over here. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Um, one of the first things I want to see going back to the previous discussion is, um, in, terms, in terms of regional travel, I know that Probably Antigua to Trinidad might be way off because it might take eight hours, but there are some countries where it's not going to work, and I think that we should probably place the effort into making it work. Because personally, I can see St. Vincent from my house. Exactly. But if I have to go to St. Vincent, I have to go up to Castries from Shuzel, take a plate, pay $600, $700, $800 to fly to St. Vincent. So I think that there are some areas that it can work, and um, probably the resources need to be pumped there. And as it relates to what Barry is saying about recognizing youth development, I also think that we should start having a discussion of making it easier for youth leaders from across the Caribbean so to I travel easier. So. Because governments travel, heads of government travel, and the easy in which they pass through the airports is like two seconds. <laughs> but when a youth leader who basically does the same thing of representing the persons within their constituencies, the persons within the country, go through the airport, I get stayed back in Trinidad and ask 15 million yes. questions yes. in Trinidad. So I think that we need to start having a discussion of making it easier for youth leaders who represent the young people in our communities to travel easier to carry on. I'm taking note of that. And <laughs> to second Nias, I don't even think it needs to be as extensive as a diplomatic passport, but making the affairs a little bit easier on our pockets because a lot of us are paying out of pocket. So, yeah, I like that. Yes, we have a question right here. All right, so this is an online question. Um, Samantha first. Shara Pasad. She's saying, what is being done after this discussion to, trill, to truly impact youth development? And then um, a follow-up question to add to what Barry asked. Um, Abashamba Grand Jones is saying that I agree with Samantha Shara Pasad question. Um, it is necessary to have a plan for youth insertion in the marketplace and to value the contributions of youth yes. entrepreneurs. Um, Samantha is actually a CYA from oh, Guyana. Guyana. Mm. Nice. So thank you, Samantha. All right. Um, just to touch on briefly, Nias, right, your first comment, which tied into what LaShawn was saying and the, the forum that I mentioned in St. Kitts. Um, in actually attempting the establishment of the regional ferry system, it was recognized that obviously it is somewhat impractical to let's say take a ferry from Antigua all the way down to Trinidad or Suriname. Nobody wants to spend that much time on a boat. Right? However, exactly. you know, we understand that. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why it was proposed that we should still at least try to interconnect the islands that are, are in close proximity. Like you mentioned, St. Vincent. I am just like you, where if I step outside, I can see St. Vincent. <laughs> right? Um, so it should be um, facilitated. Travel between um, islands in close proximity should be facilitated. However, the issue that, that came about in the implementation was that the small craft operators that they had consulted with, um, the commitment was not forthcoming. You see, the market has to be there. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a demand for the service because the persons yeah. who own the ferry more than likely have a loan to pay, huh? yeah. or a lease, if not a loan. And that's why the subsidy issue had 
you know, the, the figures were showing that there was a deficit of, I said subsidy, a deficit of five million over six years, over six months. Mm -hmm. Five million US dollars deficit over six months. Mm -hmm. That's quite a deficit, eh? Yeah. So, but, but um, so as, as close as the, as the two islands are, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and St. Lucia, there has to be a market for any entrepreneur to want to invest in a ferry service between the two, between the two islands. And, 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 you know, I think what happened with the, with the French experience is that they already had the ferries going between Guadeloupe and Marie Galant. So there was a, ferry, a small ferry service in the French communities, that in, the, in the, small, the French islands, the Saints, Marie Galant, Guadeloupe, that extended into Dominica, that then it went into Martinique, that went into St. Lucia, and that's how, it, that's how it rolled out, and then back up north. So they build out their, they build out their ferry service as we go along. But we, we need private sector input into this thing because it's, it's quite costly. Um, he proposed an online question, but it got a bit overshadowed by McAllister's what comments. What was the question? Can you repeat it? From Samantha, from Guyana. Yes, she, she was asking what can be done after this discussion to truly impact um, youth in the Caribbean. Well, I think, I think the, first, the first thing that we have to do is to follow up on the work now as far as what the secretariat can do because the issue of youth development which is mentioned is is huge it's it's, it's huge and what is it that we can do i'm here as, as part of the secretariat um, record, um, and what we can do at, from that standpoint is to follow up very assiduously on the recommendations that came out of the meeting in january and to put that start and work with the other parties that are interested um, groups to put that coordination mechanism in place and to lend the voice, the voice to the CYA to allow that thing to happen. That is my commitment in terms of what we are going to do in terms of our program on youth. Any other questions? Yes. From Another Derek? question from the online platform is for a flagship program such as the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Caucus, why CARICOM countries are reluctant on funding such a program? I, d I don't know that there's a regional fund that member states are being asked to put any money into. It's a matter of, at the national level, providing the resources at the national level. I cannot speak for the national the level. National I mean, level. but that is what it is. We, we don't, we don't, there's not a regional fund that everybody puts their money into and then it goes to the CYA. It doesn't work that way. I, I mentioned about the advocacy. I mentioned about the role that, that you could play and, and the coordinate advocacy. I think all of that would help in allowing the resources to go forward if there is value added to what is being done. I'm sure, I'm sure, um, I'm sure if you were to ask um, um, the, um, Mary, Ms. Wilfred, if she needed more resources in her youth, she's going to tell you yes. And I'm sure if you were to ask somebody else in another department, they're going to say yes. So how do you, how do you do that? It's a national yeah. issue that every country grapples with. How do you share the limited resources you have among the myriad of things that you need to get done? I don't have the answer. We have a question here and then behind <coughs> him. So two. Christians. Caribbean Youth Environment Network. Um, we speak a lot about youth issues and I want to allude to one of our issues in, uh, related to climate change. Indeed. Caribbean being one of the least contributors to climate change but being one of the most to be affected Excellent. And we look at our issue mainly of waste disposal. I recently attended the Caribbean Youth International Coastal Cleanup Coordinators in Miami. And one of our main issues is that you have coordinators sitting back, using time, going to different stakeholders, but yet still they're not getting the buy-in of the country or the leaders that be in support of the issue. Um, what can CARICOM do when it comes to on a collective way of treating or um, dialoguing with the issue of climate change, especially when it comes to waste disposal? When I say waste disposal, I speak more um, towards waste. with plastic because, yes, we have some countries such as Antigua, the Bahamas, and St. Lucia just passed this um, agreement on uh, law. Um, into for we're looking at styrofoam but the key fact is when we speak about plastic the issue stems back on yes we do maybe we do collection of plastic 
we want to do recycle, but what the Caribbean and a whole can do in help mitigating that issue, um, especially we as young persons. The issue is there to affect our health. And there m it, I think it's something that is critical and that needs to be addressed with urgency. Can I? Um, I appreciate your question, but we, I would, if the ambassador is going to answer, I would like him to tackle it from the stance of regional integration because that is in keeping with our theme mm -hmm. and maybe looking for sources of entrepreneurship work in, in <coughs> yeah. Okay. Let me separate climate change from plastic and recognize the work that the network did um, in the region in advocating for um, what the Caribbean community achieved at, the, at COP, COP24. Um, I, I, I think it, was, it is probably one of the best examples of what a community, as a community, we can do if all our voices are channeled together in a unified advocacy role. And I, and I want to commend the youth um, the network and others who were in Paris. I was in Paris, and and I left there feeling a proud Caribbean person to see the weight that we had in these negotiations to even get mention of 1.5 in the document in the declaration. That took hours and days and days and days of work, as you know. Mm -hmm. So it shows that you can succeed when you put coordinated, channeled advocacy not only within the region. You took that and you went out with it. And it wasn't, didn't just happen in Paris overnight, it, a number of cops that went before that. And that's a perfect example of, 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 the, of the region singing in one voice and having a result. Now, plastic. Plastic is an issue. It's, it's pollution. And it's, I, don't, I don't link it to climate change necessarily. More and more you're seeing, I think, the, the, the um, persons are becoming more and more aware globally on the fact that plastic pollution is a real problem. Um, that needs to be resolved now, not, not for the future. A number of countries you've mentioned have, have, um, have put in place the ban of certain importation of certain single-use plastics. I, I'm aware Senator Shaw just did that, and I think there are probably about seven or eight countries right now that have legislation, if not more. And all of them are moving towards it, all, without exception. Um, it's an issue that has been discussed by the environment ministers. It's an issue that, issue that has been discussed even at the trade level because obviously there are persons in the community who produce plastic products and they have a right to trade their products. So it's also an issue that's been discussed at the, at the coated. But I think that there is a resolve to address it. Now, how do you, how do you move from, from ban I mean, banning a straw is a simple thing. Ban you ban a straw, you can get paper straws and so on, but there are plastics that are used singly in manufacturing processes as well. And some of, the, some of the leading countries in that, I think Ghana was one of the first countries in the world to, to have banned plastics, had to roll back some of it because they went ahead and it affected some of their... So how do you do that in a systematic way and roll it out in a way that it doesn't have any adverse effect immediate but at the long run? You, it's going to be discussed at, um, at this meeting. That's what I'll say to you. Mm. It's on the agenda. Okay. Plastics. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, we have to take a break right now, but... I want the gentleman who, uh, who proposed the question, the gentleman who proposed the question, to keep in mind that St. Lucia taking a step forward on banning, they banned it, right? They banned styrofoam mm -hmm. is a peak opportunity for young people to get into some form of agro-processing to be producing our own reusable way. Because I saw a program where they did it with the husk of the bananas. And we know bananas are not as thriving as they used to be here, mm -hmm. so that could be a great alternative for us. But we're going to take a break right now. And thank you for your questions and your contributions, and thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. One of the eight universally recognized rights of the consumer is the right to be heard. This means that every consumer who is dissatisfied with a good or service has the right to lodge a complaint to the provider of that good or that service. This should be the first point of lodging a complaint. Ensure that the receipt, as proof of the transaction, is available. Climat la terre a changé. Et ça a affecté nous toutes. Cyclone qui a venu plus mauvais. Gaudelot a pris l'eau, qui a détruit les animaux et les plants. 
Prends la main à Kabedi plus chaud et qu'à tuer place qui se présente dans la gravité. La main chaude qui aussi changé de manière se présente qui a quitté de l'un côté et allé à l'autre côté. Cette liste qui a contribué en petit en gaz en l'espace. Quand un petit pays nous a essayé de faire tout ça nous a fait pour assurer qui nous baisser à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi pour empêcher la terre à venir plus chaud. Et faut pour baisser à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi, c'est mitigation. Le climat a changé. Il a changé depuis que tout le monde a la terre, car le gaz, l'huile et le chèbon. Et ça, quand on est causé la terre, il a changé plus chaud. Ça, nous ne pouvons faire tout le monde, c'est pour adapter. Faites tout ça, nous a fait pour préparer et répondre pour ces conséquences négatives à la cause du changement climat. Nous tous, ça fait quelque chose. Par exemple, nous n'y pouvons assurer qui nous protecter tout ça nous a planté. C'est vie fumier qui est naturel. Pratique quand nous pour abattre des dommages en temps cyclone et godlo. Construit canal pour de l'eau couille bien quand il faut. Et assurer qui canal là par les ordi. Faites tout ça qui est possible pour vivre en temps changement climat ça. Trouvez plus d'informations à ce plan d'adaptation national gouvernement et des marches ou même ça prend pour protéger corps et tout notre cette ici. Thank you for staying with us and thank you audience members for your questions. Um, I was really impressed. They were very thought provoking and I'm sure the ambassador has a lot to think about when he goes and lays on his bed tonight. Yes. <laughs> um, I would like to thank him for making the trip down to St. Lucia. It shows a lot because often we meet via social media, we yeah. meet on online platforms, but we never actually get to see the faces attached to the voices. And I would like to thank the ASG for being here and Miss <coughs> Michelle Small Bartley for being here as well to engage with us. And I would really like to thank those of you who are online and actively participated. I know that some of your questions did not get answered, but we still thank you for participating. And I hope that this event next year can be in maybe a more comfortable pro environment, just saying. And um, it will be even more fruitful than what it was today. Okay, I would like to call on our Director of Youth, Miss Mary Wilfred, to do the vote of thanks. Okay, so we've come to the end of this uh, youth dialogue with SG Laroc. And we want to really thank the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, S.B. Francis and McAllister Hunt for um, their commitment, devotion, and passion in organizing this dialogue. A rousing round of applause. They really did excellent. Also, I would like to thank um, Michelle, Miss Michelle Small Bartley, who uh, came on board in May and jumped right into the planning of this uh, event together with the CYAs. We were able to coordinate and discuss and to ensure that we really deliver a good um, as SG Live that the Caribbean young people can join along with us as well. Thank you, Secretary General. Thank you, Deputy Ambassador, and all the other members of the CARICOM Secretariat who are here with us today. We'd like to thank UETV yes. for being a part of this discussion. We um, feel that this has gone even beyond us because when we were planning, we were just thinking of just the live broadcast mm -hmm. and the social media networks and in income um, UETV that gave us another dimension of reaching maybe campuses and their own audience. So we really want to thank them. I'd like also to thank the staff at the Ministry of External Affairs, especially Mr. Yenver Caesar, who um, I uh, coordinated with, and the personnel at the GIS studio. They have been Excellent. phenomenal Excellent. walking us through this um, from our first site visit to giving us you know, um, information and instructions. We understand how technical this thing is, but they've made it so easy and simple for us. Bravo. Well done, guys. We really appreciate that. And to you, our young people from the various organizations who have um, straight, some of you have just come from work. Um, some of you have just 
um, landed in from university and have grabbed you in here to be a part of the audience. All of you students, uh, the National Youth Council, thank you for coming to this event. And like somebody online asked, we hope that there are going to be some actionable um, things um, that we can deliver to our young people coming from this dialogue. Thank you. Thank and you. we have a meet and greet, a small um, gathering, some refreshments for you after. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilfred. And um, I, really want to, I really want to acknowledge the role Ms. Wilfred played, messaging at all odd hours for information and assistance. And she was very graceful in assisting us. So a round of applause for her. And before you close, may I, may I finally ask for a really round of applause for great ambassadors. Yeah. Fantastic job again. Fantastic job. Thank you very much and good night everyone.